Okay, we should start. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Chen Yang Xu from University of Princeton. And uh, today I'm the moderator of the ICM sectional talk given by Professor Francis Bach. Uh, Francis Bach uh, got his PhD in the Computer Science Department of uh, University of Berkeley. And now he's uh, working at the uh, Economala Superior. He has made uh, important contributions to statistic ma machine learning. And today he will tell us about uh, gradient descent on infinitely wide neutral networks. So please start, Professor Bach. So thank you for the introduction. I would like also to thank the organizing committee for the invitation to present my work. So great honor to present at the ICM. And before I start, I would like also to acknowledge the, uh, uh, the work of my fantastic colleague, Lenaïk Chiza, now at the Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale uh, de Lausanne. So today I'm going to talk about uh, machine learning. Let me give, me, let me give some uh, context. I think in the last 20 or 30 years, there's been a growing uh, need for uh, the automatic processing of, of data. The data can come from your personal life, your pictures, also in the industry, and more and more for many sciences. And this goes from humanities to, uh, to uh, bioinformatics. A more recent change has been the surge of progress in uh, certain tasks often related to perception. For example, in computer vision, now uh, machines can recognize objects in images and videos. You can automatically transcribe your speech into text. And in natural language processing, you see a lot of automatic uh, uh, translations. Those like uh, amazing uh, progresses were fueled by machine learning algorithms that was run on massive data. And the goal of my talk is to highlight some of the algorithmic uh, components which uh, have made uh, this uh, possible. So I'm going to formalize the uh, machine learning problem uh, through like classical notations. So I'm going to assume I have some observations x, i, y, i. x, i will be an input, for example, uh, an image. y, i will be the output I want to predict, uh, typically a label on that image. And I observe n of those uh, observations. And typically, n will be quite large, could be thousands or millions or, or, or billions. The goal of uh, machine learning and statistics uh, at large is to be able to predict a new y given a new unseen x. And this is done through a prediction function h, which has two parameters. One parameter is the input x, let's say the image. And the other parameter is the uh, parameter of your estimator, here theta. And uh, theta will typically be uh, of dimension d, and d will be uh, uh, quite large. So in machine learning, there are typically uh, two types of uh, uh, prediction functions. You have the linear ones, and here it's linearity in the parameter theta. It can be a nonlinear function of your inputs. And typically, you rely on some feature vector phi of x, which is either given, typically given to you by, by some experts, or in the context of uh, advertising, phi of x, for example, could be the for every x, so every individual, what is the uh, um, the websites which have been visited uh, by that user. And from those uh, visited websites, you're going to be uh, shown some uh, uh, advertisements. So this is uh, linear models, and this goes, of course, beyond advertising. But this is, uh, as we will see, uh, problems which will be easy to solve by the linearity uh, in the parameter theta. However, many, much of the uh, recent progress uh, has been achieved by uh, neural networks, and this is the case for computer vision. So what is an artificial neural network? So you, or go, you will try to define some prediction function H, but this is uh, achieved by a sequence of linear mappings and nonlinearity. So you start from X, so here X is assumed to be in a vector space. You take a product by some linear, linear operator theta one, then you apply some nonlinearity component wise, and the nonlinearities could be sigmoid type, typically increasing, or you can be the positive part uh, uh, like that. And then you do one nonlinearity and you go on, you do a second linearity, second nonlinearity, and you go on and you get at the end a deep neural network if you have many, uh, many layers. So the recent progress has been fueled by those uh, networks, and clearly there is more 
and a fully connected neural network like this, you often add like convolutions and other things, but just to simplify, I'm showing the basic in instance of a neural network. So the way those uh, parameters are learned is by minimizing some uh, cost function called the regularized empirical risk, which is a sum of a classical data fitting term. So I have a loss, which I will, I will show examples uh, in a minute between what I want to predict, why I and my prediction function. In many applications, people use uh, least squares, so square loss, to get least square regression. Or if you have a yi being a minus one or one, you, you use a so-called logistic uh, regression, which happens to be convex uh, in H and adapted to binary classification. So this is uh, going to achieve uh, to find theta by minimizing that uh, data fitting term, which is the average of the training data. But you have to keep in mind that what counts is what happens on unseen data. So this is the expectation over data coming from the same source uh, uh, of the same loss between y and the prediction function. So here, optimization is just a, a mean to an end. So I, I've mentioned two types of models, linear models and non-linear models. So first, let me review quickly linear models because this is a, a, a place where things are reasonably uh, uh, well understood. So we're going to assume some convex loss functions, and this is what I consider a weak assumption because this is typically what people use in practice. But this, if you want to get a convex problem, you need, or it is sufficient to have H being a linear function in theta. So this only applies to linear models. And the consequence of that uh, convexity of the, of the objective function is that many algorithms exist, often based on the, on the gradient, and for which you have quantitative runtime and prediction performance guarantees. Give me your problem, your data, I can tell you based on simple statistics on the data, how long the algorithm will take and how well it should predict on unseen data. So this has led to what I call the golden years of convexity in machine learning, starting from the 90s and still uh, 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 happening now, where there has been a sequence of like the super vector machines and kernel methods, and a big wave of uh, sparsity inducing uh, uh, norm and, and problems. And in the last two years, quite a lot of work on statistic method for large scale uh, uh, learning. This is for convex models. And the goal of the talk is to explore what happens when you have a nonlinear model, in particular, what happens for deep learning. This is more difficult, and as we will see. So let's look <clears throat> at the uh, deep learning uh, uh, architecture. So again, this is a neural network starting from input X to output Y by a sequence of linear mapping and nonlinearity. Again, this is a simplification of what's happening in practice where the models are much, uh, much more complicated. So there are two main difficulties associated with uh, those models. The first one is the fact that we get a non-convex optimization problem because this function is parameterized non-linearly. So it's linear in the last, in the last layer, theta r, but it's non-linear in theta one. So this will, as, a, as we will see, this will create like potential problems. Second uh, difficulty is the fact that in recent uh, applications, then the number of parameters of those neural networks start to be very, very large. Okay, so this is this could be a problem from the statistical perspective to have so many parameters to fit. It turns out that this over parameterization will be a blessing uh, for optimization. And I will show in the second part of the talk that this is not because you are over parameterized that you cannot uh, generalize to unseen data. But let's start first with the uh, optimization issues. So what can go wrong with non-convex optimization problems? Many things. So the, big, the biggest issue is the fact that in a convex optimization problem, there's typically a unique local minimum, uh, essentially a unique local minimum, and which can be characterized by uh, just like a, a local, local uh, information. So it's essentially all stationary points are are minimum. This is not the case when you go non-convex. So here I get a simple function in two dimensions where uh, uh, you see uh, four local minimum, one, two, three, four. This one is a global minimum. But you also have other stationary points. You have a local maximum and you have a saddle points over there. The issue here is that when you run gradient descent algorithm, depending on where you start, you're going to end up typically in one of those four local minima. Okay, or sometimes in particular in the high dimensions, you may get stuck in a, in a subtle point. 
So what can we say in terms of mathematical guarantees? So the first uh, line of work has been to try to make sure that you avoid the locally incorrect uh, 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 stationary points. So you want to avoid look maximum for any amount of noise to make you go down, but you also want to avoid as those stationary points. And here, adding noise has been shown to uh, uh, escape those uh, stationary points, which are not non-local minima. And there's a, several work showing that you can get this with the guarantees. But these are only local. Why, why can't you go global? The, you cannot go global in general because a class of even like Lipschitz continuous functions is too, is too large and includes functions like this, which are flat everywhere except in a small region. And if you have a gradient-based algorithm, it will only find the global optimum if you're lucky enough to reach uh, that region. And uh, that region has a volume, it's, okay, it's large in one dimension, but in high dimension, the volume will shrink exponentially in dimension. And you can show that global optimization will always be exponential uh, in dimension. But this, of course, this is for the class of all objective functions, which are non-convex. Let's try to see what can be said for a, a neural network, which is a subject of interest of the community and of this particular talk. So we're going to reduce uh, the scope uh, uh, even more by looking at the single hidden layer neural network or the two layer, uh, two layer neural network, which is uh, com uh, composed as, as, as follows. We have the input X so in six dimensions, but imagine the input X as like billions of dimensions. Then you have the uh, set of input weights, theta one, which is a matrix okay, of size, number of inputs, number of hidden neurons. And this is a matrix theta one. You get those hidden uh, neurons after taking the nonlinearity. This is what you see here. For every J, every neuron, you multiply X, take the dot product with uh, that vector, take the nonlinearity, and then combine those once linearly. And those are the output weights. Okay. So this is a prediction function, and our goal will be to minimize uh, always the risk. And I'm going to assume the risk is convex uh, uh, in H. It's not convex in the parameters of H, not convex in theta, but it's convex in H, which is uh, typically the case in most uh, uh, applications. So why are we reducing ourselves to this one hidden layer for a very particular reason? Is uh, to, to uh, obtain a family of prediction functions which are sums of terms which have uh, uh, their own parameters. There is no sharing of parameters. So, in other words, H is a sum of our all J going from 1 to M, and J goes over hidden neurons of a function of X which uh, has its own parameters. So, the input weight parameter, theta 1, okay, and the output weight. And at the end, I'm summing all of those uh, uh, functions to obtain my H. So formally, okay, if I design, if I call WJ, the concatenation of theta two of J and theta one of J, so vector of size D plus one, then my, I have a family, which is the average of, of, some, uh, of some terms like that. And what will be key in our development is the fact that we have an average of function with no parameter sharing. This is not, this is true for one hidden layer, but if you have if you have one more layer, so say one more layer there, then it is not true that uh, the uh, output neurons before uh, you do the final uh, layer, they will. It's not true that they have, they have no shared parameters. They do share parameters. And in fact, this is one of the reasons why people like to use neural networks with deeper, with more layers because there is parameter sharing. However, for our analysis, you need to. Uh, have a one hidden layer and still reasonably open to uh, extend our results to deeper networks. So let's go. How, can, how are we going to use uh, this like independent parameterization of all of those uh, uh, units by simply using a classical insight in uh, statistics and signal processing, which is of seeing this as the integral of the function C through some uh, probability measure of DMU. If I take d mu, the empirical distribution over my uh, parameters, my particles, so my parameters of each neuron wj, we get an inequality. And the, the, the hope is that when we go over parameterize, so when m goes to infinity, that we're going to approach the behavior uh, of a 
probability distribution with a measure with respect uh, to the Lebesgue measure, with a density with respect to the Lebesgue measure. So this is often called the mean field limit uh, uh, in physics. And uh, the hope is that when M is large, you behave as, as a way, as in the same way as, as with a density. So this insight uh, is uh, quite uh, uh, classical. It dates back from Baron in the 90s and it's been used like by, by many people. And essentially, uh, it is a way of uh, linearizing the set of uh, parameters. Because now, in the parameters d mu, this is an inner function. So now I have a convex function of some linearly parameterized problem. I should be able to do something. But the key here is that there is a very non convex constraint that a mu has to be a, a, a finite sum of gaps. So let's see uh, what we can do. And I'm going to describe the joint work with uh, uh, Lenek uh, Shiza from a few years ago. And our goal is to so minimize a function of that probability measure over the set of neurons that we often call them particles. And this, uh, we don't take any form of uh, function f, but it's a convex function of the integral of a common function. Okay, so the structure is important. You need to have convexity here and the integral of a fixed function c, and I will put extra assumptions on phi uh, in a moment. So this is a measure, this is a formulation in terms of measures, but the way we're going to minimize it is as done in practice, we're going to have a finite set of particles, like m hidden neurons, we form r of the average, and we're going to do gradient descent on those parameters. So this is often called a bag propagation. And to make the analysis feasible, I'm going to take the limit of a gradient descent when the step size goes to zero, which is uh, often, which is called the gradient flow. So the M here is just for matters of normalization. I'm going to, to study this ordinary differential equation where all weight uh, move uh, simultaneously following the gradient of A with respect to uh, all parameters. So this is, as I mentioned, the limit of gradient descent when the step size goes to zero. But this is also a limit of the stochastic version of gradient descent, which is looking at data points one by one, uh, also when the step size goes to zero. So we are moving one step away from the actual algorithm as a way to get, uh, to get a proof uh, goal. So the first question is, when M goes to infinity, okay, do, do I convert to a, a particular uh, a dynamics on the set of measures? Okay, so the, the answer is yes, and, uh, and, and it turns out that this limit is exactly a Wasserstein gradient flow, and this has been uh, noticed by uh, several researchers. The idea that in the space of measures, you can define some metric, a metric will define some gradient flow, and it turns out that the metric that corresponds to that algorithm is not the Euclidean metric, it's a Wasserstein metric. So if you know what the Wasserstein measure is, Wasserstein distance is, then uh, uh, this will speak to you. Otherwise, just trust me, there is a limiting object, and the limiting object will be a, a partial differential equation that we will show in a moment on the measure, and we will study this partial differential equation that we, that we obtain. So how do we obtain this partial differential equation? Just by taking this and take, taking gradient with respect to W, okay, we need the gradient of that whole function, and you should expect that if you take gradient with respect to W, you need, you need the, gra the gradient of R and the gradient of C and using like the composition of, of, of differentials. And you see exactly what uh, this uh, 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 formula is. What you end up with for the gradient flow for neural nets is that all particles will evolve according to uh, the gradient, uh, to some uh, gradient of some like a mean potential. But that mean potential will depend on your current value and also on the aggregate value of all other neurons which are uh, already present. Okay, so this is the mu, is the current, this current empirical measure of all neurons. So when mu is not moving, you get independently moving neurons. But when they move, mu is moving, and you get at the end a uh, 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 coupled ODEs. This is what makes the problem uh, uh, interesting. And uh, what you can show is that. Um, it's classical, it's called a transport uh, equation, is that if uh, the number m of uh, particles go to infinity, then you will define a, a measure with the density mu t, and mu t will evolve according to a PDE, the, the time derivative of mu, with some divergence of mu times the, uh, the mean potential. So this is 
the PDE we would like to converge to. And what we showed uh, with uh, Lenek Shiza is that with extra assumptions, which have been not uh, detailed, I just want to show that you need assumptions, okay, on of differentiability of the map R and C. And if you initialize in a compact set, then the, uh, if your initial measure uh, is uh, limiting, uh, if your initial measure is the limit of a set of uh, empirical measures, then mu t will, uh, when you move those uh, particles one by one, will also converge to some measure, which is the solution of the uh, PD. It's just like showing formally that uh, there's a limit when m goes to infinity. This happens to be a mass and gradient flow, and this is uh, the equation. So now we will study that uh, PDE. So this is the over parameterized limit. Now we have an object, which is a PDE. We want to study if it is globally converging. In the same that if I launch uh, that mu, uh, that dynamics will obtain the global minimum of F. And it turns out that this is, um, uh, this is the case. So this is what we have shown with, uh, with NIAC in here. I'm only uh, giving the informal theorem and uh, refer to refer you to the uh, article in the proceeding for the exact uh, uh, for the exact uh, technical conditions. There are, but they are a bit too long to, to present here. And the the main message here is that with the correct assumptions, which I will describe in a moment, then the gradient flow, the limiting gradient flow at ZPD, when T goes to infinity, can only converge to the to a global optimum of the uh, cost function. So here's the difficulty is the fact that uh, uh, there are stationary points of the dynamics. Okay, so it has been well known that if you if you optimize the neural networks, sometimes you can get stuck. And it turns out that if uh, the number of neurons is very large, infinite here for the for the theorem to hold, then you will always reach. Uh, if you convert to some place, it will always be a global optimum. So what are the assumptions that you need? Of course. Uh, uh, many like technical ones, but the two key ingredients are first homogeneity and a good initialization. So homogeneity means that you need to be at least fully homogeneous or partially homogeneous with respect to some, uh, some of the variables. And for neural networks, this is true with respect to the, to the last layer. If you multiply, if you multiply the last layer by, uh, by a number, you multiply the output by the same number. So it's like one homogeneity. But there are uh, activation functions uh, like the positive part, the max of yourself in zero, which is itself homogeneous. And the overall uh, psi is too homogeneous. If you multiply by lambda theta two and theta one, you multiply by lambda square, and it will be important for the second part of the talk. You need homogeneity, otherwise, it's not true. We have counterexamples of global convergence if you're not homogeneous. And you need the initial measure to be well spread. So essentially, you need like a density of a, in all directions. Okay? And this is, in fact, the way uh, practitioners initialize neural networks by taking random Gaussians. Uh, and this is what we need uh, as well. All right. So now we have this uh, informal theorem, uh, which is which has a exact like a, the formal version in the paper. What I want to highlight here, this is only qualitative and in stark contrast with what you could obtain in the convex case. In the convex case, we're able to give you time uh, guarantees. You would need that amount of time. Here, I will not tell you how big M needs to be to reach this mean field limit, and I have no notion of convergence time. And this is still an uh, ongoing work. So let's see uh, a simple uh, simulations to uh, understand what, what's happening here. So here I'm going to consider a, a neural network working in two dimensions. Okay, so this means that I have, for each neuron, I have three parameters, the two input parameters and the one output parameter. But because I'm using this positive part here, I'm going to represent one neuron by the product of the uh, vector in 2D here times the weight, uh, the weight uh, of theta two. And this fact gives me a way to represent neurons in the 2D plane. So in all of those plots, you see like representations of, of neurons. So the WJs are represented in, 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 in 2D. For to run those simulations, we, we have like generated data from the neural net with five neurons. Okay, so we know that with five neurons, when we when we estimate parameters, we have enough to get perfect predictions. The idea is to check whether uh, how many neurons you need to put in your model to reach that good performance. And we're going to reach the good performance 
when the when the neurons that you see here are moving and end up in the five dashed lines, which are the uh, optimal positions. So on the left, if we use exactly the number of neurons necessary, which are sufficient to do perfect predictions, then some neurons are well estimated and some are not. And this is a classical uh, uh, local minimum issue that, we, that has been well known in the training neural networks. However, if you take a lot, uh, a lot of neurons, and this is what our result is suggesting, M is very large, then all neurons end up being in the, the correct places. And the open problem is trying to understand what's happening at the intermediate level where M is not very large, but still quite large. And we see that there's typically a some transition phase where when M gets large enough with overwhelming, overwhelming probability, uh, uh, then uh, you're going to get the global optimum. And this is still like uh, not, uh, not fully understood. So a small video that you can see, you start all like, Neurons in all uh, in all uh, uh, in all like directions here, and uh, then they start to to move along and strike by following a weird uh, uh, path and up at the correct places. I'm highlighting this. This is not like going in a straight line. The neurons move in very uh, particular directions, very specific directions, and end up having a global convergence. So just to highlight the uh, uh, the response. Ah, so this is uh, for neural nets, but this applies to all problems for which you want to minimize problems uh, of of that form. Or when you when you oh, can I go back? Uh, when you minimize problem, uh, uh, when you minimize problem, manage to do it of that form. When you have a, a loss of loss and integrals, so this includes uh, spider convolution. This, this includes also uh, other problems. Right. So as a, as, a, as a summary, what we have seen so far is that uh, with, uh, if you have a prediction function of that form, okay, essentially like a neural net, so here is a, a positive part as an activation function, if the number of neurons go to infinity, then the garden flow will converge to the global optimum. If you initialize things uh, correctly, again, there's no uh, quantitative results. All right, so now in, in practice, uh, there are two ways to do like optimization. Either you do at every data point, you do, uh, uh, you, you update uh, the, the parameters. And this is known to avoid overfitting because you do a single pass over the data. And in fact, it tends to underfit a bit. But what uh, people do in practice is uh, doing multiple passes over the data. Okay, so you see the, every point once, then twice and several times. And then it's known that uh, uh, you should convert to the optimal predictor on the training distribution. There's potentially an issue in how it generalizes on, uh, to unseen data, in particular when you have a, a lot of parameters. So this is over parameterization was a blessing for optimization. It could be an issue uh, for, uh, uh, for uh, testing performance. And the goal of the last part of the talk is to highlight that this can be also a study. So we know to need to study what people call the interpolation regime. This is all those situations where you have sufficiently many parameters to perfectly fit the data. So here, if the number of parameters, in our case, every hidden neuron comes with d plus one parameters, d for the input weight, one for the output weight, and M, when M is sufficiently large, you can typically find uh, uh, H, which, which has a perfect fit. Okay, so perfect fit on the training data says uh, nothing uh, on, the, uh, on the testing data. Okay, but here there's something very specific about uh, the, the problem is that we are obtaining H not randomly by exhaustive search, but by the output of gradient descent. And potentially, this output of gradient descent has some uh, has some uh, properties among all interpolating uh, estimators. It has it, it has some special properties, and this is often called the implicit bias of uh, HGD. And what has been known and proved in many instances is that this implicit bias in finite dimensions is typically an Euclidean norm uh, 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 bias. So among all the edges that you, that you have here, you minimize the L2 norm 
of the parameter of theta. This is essentially the implicit bias uh, in, the, in those problems. And there's a nice series of works by Gunaseka, Sudri, and, and Srebo, and, and Woodworth, and colleagues, and colleagues showing that this is the case. Here, we have a one extra uh, complication is that we want to study over parameterized networks. Okay, so it doesn't mean the L2 norm in infinite dimensions has to be uh, well defined. It is the goal of the last part of the talk to see that uh, we can characterize uh, the implicit bias for those uh, two, higher, two hidden layer neuron networks. This will be done for a very particular setup, which is a uh, logistic regression. So this is the uh, binary classification problem when you have. Uh, the output is a binary label, minus one and one, and we use a logistic loss function, which I've showed uh, uh, earlier. And we're going to consider the uh, over parameterized regime with, an, uh, again, a predictor, which is uh, an average of more and more uh, uh, predictors. And we're going to focus here on the homogeneous activation function. So as you should expect, you will converge to a function H, which is perfectly separating the data. So after rescaling, the product of H and Y will be 3D positive. Okay, so this is like perfect prediction because typically in those binary uh, classification setups, you predict as a sign of H. And if Y times H of XI is positive, then you make perfect predictions at training time. But to be able to say anything at testing time, we need some implicit bias. And this is uh, going to be in the form of a norm. And what we will show is that among all of those functions H, which are satisfying this, and there are many of them, we select one with some minimal norm. We need to exhibit that norm, and that will get some properties of the, of the that will give us some properties on the learning problem in terms of a generalization. So I will, uh, this is also joint work with uh, uh, Lena and Chisa, and we're going to look at two different regimes. One where we optimize only over the last layer. Okay, so the first layer is being sampled and fixed. We optimize over the last layer, and we to recover traditional convex problems, so that should be easier. And one where we, we, we call that a kernel regime for reasons that will appear uh, soon. And we can also uh, optimize the two layers, and this is what the, to me the interesting regime where we can learn uh, learn some uh, uh, features. So the theta one, the direction will be adapted to the problem. So for that, we're going to define two norms, which are very much related. And since we're going to look at the over parameterized regime, we're going to consider prediction functions, which are like weighted, uh, which are like uh, the uh, weighted sum of infinity many neurons. So eta, you get tau is a uniform measure on the sphere. And I'm going to take uh, uh, input neurons everywhere on the sphere, and they will be uh, with a given weight. And the web will be in, a, in a, with the value of A of eta. If A of eta, D of eta is a Dirac, I get one, one neuron. But in general, this is not the case. So uh, we can define two norms, one based on the L2 norm, the squared L2 norm of that function A, and one based on the L1 norm. So for the squared L2 norm, then we obtain a reproducing kernel Hilbert space for which we can define the kernel very precisely. We can look at the paper and the proceedings to see uh, to see the specific formula. And as any uh, reproducing kernel Hilbert space, you essentially get in the RD uh, subordinate space with an index, the number of derivatives, which is at least D over two, D being the underlying dimensions. So this means that whenever I'm going to look at the kernel regime, then I'm going to have smooth functions. However, when I'm going to, to consider the L1 norm, so I'm removing the, uh, removing the one uh, here, uh, I still have this average, this continuum average of neurons, but I play like the L1 norm. And with the L1 norm, I can achieve uh, uh, measures A times D tau, which are singular. Okay? So this means that I have a much bigger space that can include single neurons. Okay? So that set, if you're the finite norm, you're not allowing single neurons, so single neurons are not smooth. Whereas here you can uh, get, uh, you allow single neurons, it's a, much, uh, it's a much bigger space. And this norm is often called the variation norm, and has been studied by several, uh, by the line of work in similar processing and statistics uh, studying this. 
So let's look first at the kernel regime. I have the prediction function like this. I'm only optimizing about the output weights and what uh, uh, we showed. And again, this is just the informal theorem uh, to make things uh, simple that when M goes to infinity, so we know that the gradient flow should convert to the global optimum from what we have seen earlier on. But which one? In terms of RDC, the one with minimum uh, kernel norm. So among all the functions that are separating the data and would consider smooth ones. So here, because I have a convex problem, I can get a quantitative analysis, which is uh, which is uh, possible here. Okay. A small note uh, for the experts is that so here it's not useful in practice to let m go to infinity because as soon as m is larger the number that the number of observations you can use a so-called kernel trick to uh, do learning with the with the kernel and not learning with the random feature uh, expansion and again for the experts here this is uh, uh, this uh, setup when m goes to infinity is often related to the so-called double descent phenomenon with a very nice paper by andre montanari and colleagues uh, 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 about that now let's look at the feature learning regime. So this is where both theta two and theta one can be optimized. And this is what people do in practice. They do gradient descent on all parameters. And what uh, we were able to show is that the, the norm, which is implicitly minimized by, by the output of gradient descent is the so-called violation norm, which is a L1 norm over the, uh, the weight of the continuum of neurons. So here uh, I, this is you're going to learn typically a, a singular measure. So you get only a finite number of uh, active neurons, and those neurons are adapted to your problem. This is what we call that we have learned uh, features on the data. Before, when theta one was just selected randomly, it was random and never moved. So you were never really adapted to your data. So here, things are moving really to adapt to your data. And if your prediction function happens to depend only on the linear subspace of your data. For example, if it depends only on the few variables that we show in a moment, then you get uh, uh, adaptivity to it. So the algorithm will find it if you learn theta one and it will not find it if you don't learn theta theta. As on the side, uh, this problem, although we have a norm, okay, we don't know any uh, polynomial time algorithm to solve it. So here, Again, we have a qualitative result showing that if M goes to infinity, things are fine, but I'm not able to tell you how big M uh, needs to be. So let me uh, compare the, the two. Uh, let me look at the uh, optimization of the, the, uh, for the variation norm. So we showed uh, two plots, the plot of parameters, the output weights, okay? They will live in a, in a 3D because we, we need to consider data in, uh, in 2D, but I'm going to consider uh, a linear term plus a constant term, often called a bias, a bias term. So now my neurons live in uh, 3D. They were living in 2D uh, for the last video. Now they live in, uh, in, uh, in uh, 3D. Now on the right, I'm going to plot the space of predictors. So in 2D, I have data in 2D. I'm going to see the separator between those two, uh, the two classes. So let's we start, uh, we start with uh, data uniformly, uh, well, neurons uniformly on the sphere. The prediction function between the plus and minus is not, is not very good. And as I will move along, the neuron will move, will start to go in specific directions, and the uh, prediction function will start to be better and better. And at the end, we will we'll see that a finite number of neurons uh, because we have a piecewise or fine bundles. So let's look at this. So the neurons move, okay, they, are, they start they tend to coalesce and converge into the measure of annuals tend to convert to the axe, and you obtain at the end a good a good separator uh, here. And you see the lines there, they are straight lines uh, highlighting the fact that the, the measure that we, that we converge to is uh, singular, and only a few neurons are uh, available at the end. The spherical cap here is due to the fact that because we use the positive part uh, uh, as an activation function, some neurons are always in the, negative, in the negative part of the positive part, so always go to zero. There's no gradient, and hence they don't move. So they're not active uh, at the end. Now let me compare for the two, for the two sets of uh, uh, optimization routines. If I optimize only over the last layer, this was the kernel regime. 
And if I optimize over the two layers, it's called the feature learning regime. And, uh, oh, sorry. And now you see on the left, uh, this is if you train only the output layer, you get to get a smooth boundaries. Well, on the right, we get a, a non-smooth boundaries. And this highlights the fact that the optimization algorithm, okay, is, will dictate the implicit bias. The two are perfect predictions on the training data, but because when we change the way we uh, do the algorithm, so only output layer and here the two layers, we get a different implicit bias. And this is uh, that one will generalize better for reasons I will explain in a moment. So for this, uh, what we show with uh, Lenaik in the paper is that if your uh, classification problem can only be solved, can be solved only by looking at a small number of variables, then those variables will be identified by the L1 norm uh, algorithm. You get this classical L1 norm effect, and it will not be identified uh, by the L2 norm uh, penalty, and that, that will lead to more the need for more observations. So the way we can uh, 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 Illustrate it is by taking data in dimension 15, but the first two coordinates are as shown below. You can get perfect prediction, and the other 13 are just like noise. Okay, so if you don't, if you identify the two coordinates, then you, you're going to do very well good predictions. If you don't, you will have to live with the 13 variables, 13 dimensions of noise, and this will be quite slow. And this is what you observe here. In blue, the L1 norm uh, as the, the, the test error as a function of number of observations. So both go to zero, but both go down. So you learn as you learn better, you perform better as you get more observations. But you, uh, the L1 norm penalty will tend to converge much quicker because it identifies quickly uh, the correct directions whereas the output layer, output layer does not. And this is one key advantage of neural networks. They do feature learning. They're going to adapt to the data more than uh, common methods. And this is just an illustration uh, here. So uh, to summarize, I've uh, proposed like uh, a qualitative analysis of gradient descent for two layer neural nets. And the take home message is the, uh, the benefits of over parameterization. If you have infinitely neurons, then you can get global convergence. And this uh, in terms of prediction performance, we could still analyze what's happening and provide, uh, provide some uh, at least clear definition of what to converge to, what norm you are implicitly minimizing when you minimize, when you estimate those models for gradient descent. Again, this is only qualitative. Uh, uh, so in terms of open problems, clearly quantifying the dependence in M number of neurons and T time, this is still an open problem. Try to go beyond this uh, extension to uh, uh, beyond the fully uh, connected neural networks, trying to go to convolution nets, which is used a lot in the computer vision. And also, of course, trying to go uh, beyond uh, uh, more beyond like a single layer. So the final conclusion, the first part of the talk introduction, there was the convex world, but everything was with qualitative guarantees. And now we have the non-convex world, we have only qualitative guarantees, and the hope will be to, of course, bridge uh, those two. So as I've mentioned, at the open problems, you have quantitative guarantees for deep models, but you also have a lot of other problems where uh, you want to deal with optimization, okay, in particular if you have multiple, multiple computers. And what I want to finish on is that to analyze those like deep models, I think we need different tools that we are typically used to uh, in optimization statistics, okay, based on like probability, martingale, and, uh, and inequalities. And in this talk, uh, I've shown like partial differential equations and vast and gradient flows as the key uh, component, but more and more we need uh, elements for um, different mathematical uh, domains, in particular PDEs, and now more and more from control theory. Thank you for your attention. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the great talk. Uh, I think that's the end of the online part of the lecture. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Should I disconnect? Yeah. Yeah, probably we just disconnect. Okay, thank you.
Hello, shall, shall we just leave? <laughs>